Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar in the spring 2023 series presented by Newton Conservators. As most everyone probably knows, we're an all volunteer nonprofit established in 1961, and we work to preserve and maintain open space in Newton. My name is Beth Wilkinson. I'll be the moderator of this virtual event, and Barbara Bates is our technical director. On behalf of the conservators, we are really grateful for the beauty and sustenance that the land provides for humans and the other creatures with whom we share the earth. We acknowledge that the Massachusetts stewardship of this land that kept its ecological communities vibrant, strong, and interconnected for thousands of years, and we hope to work with them as we strive to maintain and restore our open spaces. In tonight's presentation, Ivy Yen will speak about her wonderful research, which was covered in the New York Times, about how small mammal personalities, whether they be shy or bold, differentially select and cache seeds to influence forest regeneration. She will explain to us that it takes a range of personalities to maintain forests. Ivy is a doctoral student in the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Conservation Biology at the University of Maine in the lab of wildlife ecologist Alessio Mortellulidi. We're very fortunate that Ivy is here tonight to share her research with us. It's really amazing to get a chance to see new scientific observations as they develop. Welcome, Ivy. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Beth. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you everyone for inviting me to this webinar. I'm really excited to be sharing some of the research that we're doing at the University of Maine. Uh, most of the time I'm talking to academic audiences, experts that have already heard this a million times, so it's great to be able to reach new audiences and to kind of generate this excitement that I always have um, for small mammals. So I'll be presenting on how small mammal personalities may shape forests under changing climates. And I'll be presenting on behalf of the principal investigator of this study, which is Alessio Mortaliti, as well as all the graduate students underneath him. And this work was funded by the National Science Foundation, the University of Maine, and the graduate student government of the University of Maine. So how do forests come to be the way that they are? For simplicity, let's just consider the trees within a forest. If you think back to what we've learned in our high school biology courses, we would come up with answers like local geography, the climate, precipitation, and soil characteristics, factors that all determine the environmental conditions and dictate what kinds of things can thrive there. But these things don't really answer the question of how the trees got there in the first place. This is where we need to consider how plants move, the dispersal of their seeds. It's the one chance in their lifetime that a plant has to find a safe place to germinate and grow into their adult form. This stage in a plant's lifetime is so critical that they have evolved an incredible number of solutions to solve this problem of movement. Some seeds, in, uh, some seeds have evolved um, the ability to harness the power of the wind to so, such as maple seeds, which have evolved wings that help them stay airborne in the wind, slow their descent and move them farther away from the parent tree. Others disperse ballistically, exploding out from pods into the environment and others still use the involuntary movement of animals attaching onto passerbys with their barbs and hooks. But the most common evolved strategy for seed producing plants is animals by enticing them to eat their seeds and fruits. And in fact, it's estimated that approximately 50 to 90% of seed bearing plant species rely on animals to disperse their seeds. One of the most important animal dispersers are small mammals. And small mammals are exactly what you would expect them to be. They're mammals that are small. And so these are animals such as squirrels, chipmunks, mice, and voles. And no doubt you've seen chipmunks stuffing their cheek pouches full of the seeds that you've freshly just put into your bird feeders. Or maybe you've seen some viral videos of acorns pouring out of the walls of houses that were made by squirrels. 
In one season, a single small mammal can handle thousands of seeds. So it might be no surprise that in small mammal territories, preferred seeds may have harvest rates as high as 95%. So clearly small mammals can play the role of seed disperser and seed predator simultaneously, which is an interesting dilemma for the plant because the seed needs to entice animals enough to move them, but maybe not enough that they'll always be eaten right away. To prove this contentious relationship, seeds have evolved various defenses like hard shells, like the black walnut, bitterness, like the tannins in an acorn, or early germination cycles and masting in order to escape predation and level out the playing field. But it's a delicate balance. So studying the factors that determine when small mammals will act as dispersers or predators to a seed is an important field of work if we are to understand how they influence germination probabilities and thus forest regeneration. To flesh out this relationship a little more, let's switch over to the animal perspective. So many animals hoard food. It's a strategy that allows animals to create a safety net. By storing food in times of plenty, they can survive times of scarcity. And it's an innate behavior in response to fluctuations in seasonal food availability. And this is particularly important for small mammals because they aren't large enough to migrate in the winter and follow food availability, but they're also too small to put on significant fat reserves during the winter. And so they need to store this food so that they can eat it later. Hoarding behavior is typically categorized as two types. There are your larger hoarders here on the left, and they're, one, they're, they're the ones that put all of their eggs in one basket, like the American red squirrel that stashes all of their pine cones in one midden. On the other end of the spectrum are scatter hoarders like gray squirrels that make many, many small caches and rely on their spatial memory in order to recover these caches. Now, the primary difference between these two strategies are that larger hordes are defendable, but then very obvious, and scattered hordes are undefendable, but non-obvious. To continue the analogy, some put all of their eggs in one basket, but if they can't actively defend their basket, they might start putting their eggs in many small hidden baskets, relying on the low density of the seeds or the eggs and concealment in order to protect their resources. From the plant's perspective, it's much more beneficial to be picked up by a scatter hoarder than a larder hoarder because it's not being stored in a den underground or in a midden competing against hundreds if not thousands of other seeds. And so in this simple comparison, larder hoarders are primarily seed predators and scatter hoarders are primarily seed dispersers. But even within a species, hoarding behavior is a spectrum we might need to go even deeper in order to understand the intricacies that determine whether an animal is going to aid or constrain seed dispersal. So let's start at the beginning. When faced with a seed, a small mammal can make many different decisions. They can choose to harvest the seed or to ignore it. If they decide to harvest the seed, they can then decide whether they want to cash it or maybe they want to eat it right away. Then when they cache it, they have to decide how far away are they gonna take it? What's a safe place to put it? And what kind of microhabitat are they gonna store it? And then they have to decide when they're going to recover the seed. Each of these decisions have huge implications for the seed. If seeds are ignored, immediately predated or recovered, then there's little to no chance of survival. In these cases, the small mammal is acting more antagonistically toward the seed. But if harvested and cached in a good location for germination and it's not recovered, and this is the key here, then the chances of seed survival are boosted. And maybe animals don't recover them either because they forget where the cache is, they don't need it anymore, or maybe they die. And so in these cases, the small mammal is acting as a disperser, providing the seed with transport as well as an opportunity to grow farther away from the parent tree. So these decisions are depicting the seed dispersal process, and it's what our lab is interested in fleshing out. 
What are the extrinsic factors that guide a small mammal's decision to harvest rather than ignore a seed? So far, we know that things such as forest structure, weather, luminosity, and predator presence will change the pathway that a small mammal takes on the seed dispersal process. And what are the intrinsic factors of seeds to small mammals? We know that small mammals typically prefer larger seeds and ones with a higher caloric value. And, but what about the animal characteristics such as species and sex that can shape this relationship? Which of these factors are the most important drivers in determining where and how far small mammals cache their seeds? I know I've asked a lot of questions, but essentially the big question is, how do all of these things come together to determine whether a small mammal will be an ally or just a consumer in the plant-animal relationship? A lot of research is dedicated to each one of these topics. And as computing power improves, technology advances, and greater research effort is invested, a clearer picture is being painted of how small mammals change the composition of the seed bank and thus shape forests. In our lab, a factor that's often overlooked that we focus on is individual personality. Now, before I delve into why personalities are so important, I'm gonna first define it. So personality is defined as the consistent individual behavioral variation over time, which is correlated across contexts. For example, an individual with a bold personality will tend to score higher on boldness at later points in time, and will also tend to be more bold in different contexts, such as foraging and mating. For like a human example, a shy person will be shy in the office and when they're grocery shopping, they'll probably also be more shy. They'll be shy five months from now and shy five years from now. We know that personality is heritable and since the mid 2000s, evidence of personality has been documented in virtually all taxa, including insects. So now that we've established how ubiquitous research is, uh, how ubiquitous personality is, research has now shifted to trying to uncover the ecological consequences of personality. What does it mean and why does it exist? We investigate how different personalities move through space, how they differ in their diet and habitat preferences, and how they employ different foraging strategies. The important point here is that not all individuals are the same. They differ in traits such as exploration, sociability, and anxiety. And so we're at a point now where rather than asking questions that are focused on averages, where we chalk up in variation as noise around a mean, we're focusing on the importance of the variation, the importance of the individual. Personalities are found in all animal taxa, not by chance. They exist because different individuals are better adapted to different circumstances. So from a conservation standpoint, conserving populations and species doesn't just mean conserving biological diversity or even just conserving genetic diversity, but it also means conserving behavioral diversity. Understanding the role of personality can help us predict how individuals vary in their contribution to ecosystem functions. If we take into account our changing world, the impacts of rapid climate change, deforestation, urbanization, these things might affect some individuals more strongly than others. Think of how personalities differentially select for habitats and use resources. Certain habitat types and specific resources may be degrading more quickly than others, which pose greater risk for certain individuals. This can become a big issue if those certain individuals are also the ones that play disproportionate roles in ecosystem functions. If the behavioral composition of populations are altered, it may mean that the ecosystem services we rely on may dwindle more quickly than we expect. For small mammals, some individuals may be more mutualistic and others may be more antagonistic in the seed dispersal process. And so as we think about how to conserve natural systems and maintain healthy populations, we'll need to consider that the parts that make up the whole because they're not always equivalent. So now that I've set the stage a little, I'm going to introduce you to some of our main characters and dive into how we determine personality and how we track individual decisions. 
On the left here is a juvenile deer mice, a deer mouse. Um, his dorsal pelage is still gray, but when he reaches adulthood, he'll be a tan, russet, reddish brown color. And you can tell deer mice apart from normal house mice because they have a white underbelly. And it's thought that this is um, that this has evolved because deer mice are very arboreal. And so when you look up in the tree and they have a white belly, they're less conspicuous. Deer mice are one of our most important species that we study at our sites because they are primarily granivores. And some interesting trivia about deer mice is that they're thought to be Walt Disney's inspiration for Mickey Mouse. So here's a small video of a small deer mouse grooming. He has an ear tag and I'll, I'll talk about why we use those. And he also has a little bit of a cut on his ear, which is because we take samples to genetically identify um, deer mice because there's another mouse that is very, very similar looking to them. Um, so that's why it's not round. Now this guy in the middle here is a red back vole. They have a very distinct red band that goes from the head all the way down their back and they're omnivorous and they eat almost anything. In the video that I'm just about to play, he's either drinking from the moss or he's eating the moss, but they'll eat lichen, fruit, insects, seeds, anything that they can get their hands on. They have super soft fur and they have this really interesting behavior where they actually lose weight prior to the onset of winter to decrease competition for food because they huddle communally. And he has, it looks like he has like a band on his back. It's a little gray. Um, we actually cut their fur in like very specific um, patterns so that we can visually identify that this is a unique individual. So typically their fur is really beautiful, um, but that's why that is there. And so the last guy here on the right is the northern short-tailed shrew. And although they're not granivores, I wanted to show them because they still exhibit caching behavior. They are voracious insectivores and also one of the few venomous mammals in the world. And so they can paralyze their prey and cache them alive to eat them later. And you can see he also has a little bit of a haircut. So we've been conducting our study on these guys um, and their personality for eight years now in central Maine at the Penobscot Experimental Forest, which is a forest that's made of many different compartments of forests that have been managed differently. A lot of research that's done here is trying to understand how logging practices or silviculture practices change forest regeneration patterns. We work in three different types of forests, an even aged forest where the trees are about all the same age, a two stage shelter wood with retention forest, which is similar to the even forest, but before logging some large trees were retained um, for habitat and seed production. Um, and lastly, we work in a forest type that has been unmanaged since the late 1800s, which is pretty rare in Maine. So these, this site is a really cool place to be able to answer questions for how different habitat types are affecting small mammals. You can see in these photos that the forest structure is vastly different between each of these sites. And so if you can imagine you're a small mammal, you're afraid of getting eaten by basically everything and you're trying to find cover, how the forest is structured is really important for uh, determining how you're gonna move through that space and whether you're gonna survive or not. So at our study sites once a month from June to October, we set out two types of traps to catch small mammals. You're already familiar with the deer mouse, the red back vole, and the northern short-tailed shrew. And you probably also know the American red squirrel as well as the eastern chipmunk. But maybe some animals that you didn't know that we also catch are the northern and the southern flying squirrel. And we also catch shrews that are as little as three grams um, they look just, just as similar um, as the short-tailed shrew, but they're just teeny tiny. 
and they have such a high metabolism that if they don't eat within four hours, they'll actually die. Um, but beyond that, so tra back to trapping. Um, we use two different kinds of traps, a uh, tomahawk trap here on the top right, which we bait with peanut butter and the American red squirrels and the chipmunks love that. And then the second trap we use is a longworth trap, which uh, Lesio loves to call the Cadillac of small mammal traps. What's really cool about this trap is that there's two different compartments to the trap. There is the first part, which is on the bottom left. It's a, um, it, it contains the trapping mechanism for the trap, but then there's a separate compartment, the housing compartment that we can stuff full of bait and bedding to keep our animals comfortable. And so the reason that there are two separate things is because you can set them at an angle, which keeps our animals nice and dry and safe when it's raining. So once captured, we then collect um, data such as the weight, the sex, the age, and the reproductive status of our individuals. And then we mark them with three unique IDs so that we can identify them when they're recaptured. We use pit tags, which are called passive integrated transponders, but they're basically the same thing as the microchips that vets implant in your dogs or cats. At <clears throat> We also use ear tags and haircuts, as I said earlier, so that we can visually identify them. And these unique identifiers allow us to track changes in density, movement, and growth rates. Here um, are photos of some of my coworkers. This is Bridget weighing a, this might be a, I actually don't know what that is. It's very difficult to tell. It looks like a mouse to me, but it might be uh, a jumping mouse which I didn't talk about, but, but it's a small mammal. And then on the right is Maisie. Um, she's been working on a lot of the same um, experimental setup that I'll be discussing later. So now that we've captured our animals, how do we measure their personality? It would save us a lot of time and a lot of money if mice could talk and fill out Myers-Briggs personality tests for us, but they don't, or at least they don't speak the same language. So we measure personality using three different behavioral tests. In our project, we run individuals through only once per month so that they're not habituated to the test. We measure traits such as boldness, anxiety, exploration, and docility and then calculate how repeatable these behaviors are from month to month so that we can determine which of these traits that we've measured are actual personality traits. So on the left here, I'm gonna play a video of the emergence test. And it's basically a test where we are measuring boldness. We put individuals into a clean Longworth trap into a dark box and we measure how long it takes for them to exit the trap. So here I'm locking the door open and there's a vole in there. And he comes out pretty quickly. He doesn't, you know, dwell too long at the, at the mouth of the trap and he just comes out entirely. We would interpret this as a pretty risky behavior. This is a pretty bold individual. As I said earlier, basically everything wants to eat a small mammal. And so having a potential predator have just reached their hands into your trap and like three seconds later you're emerging is a pretty striking behavior of boldness. And we'll see individuals that don't emerge out of this trap for the entire duration of the test and some that kind of just stay at the mouth of the trap and kind of wait to see what happens for the entire test as well. So it's pretty striking here already to see how variable individuals are. So next on the right here um, is something called the open field test. It's a very common test that animals use to measure um, animal personality. It's a pretty simple test where you just put your individual into the box and the four little dots on the bottom of the box are marking the center of the box. When you put the animal into there, we're looking for behaviors such as rearing where they're putting their paws up onto the side of the box. Uh, we're looking at how fast they're moving, the total distance that they're covering. We're looking at the grooming behavior and we're looking at jumping behavior, but one of the big important behaviors we're looking at is how often they cross that center of the box. 
so small mammals are very, I would say, uh, vigilant individuals, um, species speaking, and they'll typically stick to the edge of the box here because it's safer. It's more, you have one side of your body that's more protected. And so individuals that are crossing that center of the box are exhibiting risky, bold behavior. So this is a mouse, he is grooming here. He's rearing here on the box, another rear. It's kind of sticking closer to the edges of the box. Oh, he just went through the center of the box. Lots of little rears. These rears we interpret as exploratory behavior. They're checking out their environment, which is another important um, characteristic to understand how these individuals are moving and interacting with their space. And so this is to give you an idea of what our numbers look like, what our data set looks like, and all of the information that's supporting the basis of the experiments that we run in our study sites. I just finished collecting data on my most recent uh, seed experiment. And the main objective here was to understand how small mammals will assist the dispersal of seeds under the threat of climate change. As temperatures continue to rise and, and precipitation patterns are altered, the habitable range of plant species are expected to shift to higher latitudes and elevations. Maine is located at the northern range of 64 tree species. And so it's the perfect place to begin to look at how this relationship may play out. To be able to survive, these plants will need to move and those that depend on small mammals might begin to come into contact with populations that are naive to these seed species. Different personalities may react differently to these new seed species, and it might be the behavioral composition of main forests that are an important determinant in whether a migrating tree species will be able to track its habitable range. Perhaps it will be the behavioral be flexible or the less neophobic individuals that will be more mutualistic to their tree species. But I haven't finished analyzing all the data, so stay tuned. So to set up the experiment, I selected um, acorns as our test, uh, as our seed species, because this family of acorns, uh, acorns as a family are very different in different traits such as mass, nutritive content, tannin content, um, as well as their perishability. And so to be able to select acorns that have all these like unique combination of traits will allow us to be able to disentangle whether individuals and personalities are really responding to novelty or maybe they're just responding to seed traits. So here in this picture of the acorns, on the right is the northern red oak and the burr oak right next to it. These two seeds are native acorns um, in Maine in our, our study site, whereas the other four here, the willow oak, pin oak, the scarlet oak, and the black oak are novel acorns that are from southern ranges and that are expected to shift to these higher latitudes. So then in the fall of each year, I set out trays of these acorns. Um, I painted them and set them with fluorescent powder in order to track where the seeds were being cached. I also set up an antenna and an RFID reader board that reads the microchips we implanted in each individual, as well as a camera so that we can record and watch who was doing exactly what with which seeds. And if you remember the decision tree from earlier, the camera captures whether an individual harvests or ignores a seed, but beyond the frame of the camera, we have no idea what is happening. So to understand what is happening in the field beyond the camera, I would slip back out to the stations in the pitch dark, generally around 3 or 4 a.m., and use a UV flashlight to follow tiny mice footprints to their caches. Essentially, I was just treasure hunting. And one day technology will catch up and we'll be able to collar mice with tiny cameras to track all of their decisions. But for now, fluorescent powder and a lot of coffee will have to do. So these are some photos uh, from my experiment. On the left is a photo of a seed tray where a flying squirrel has taken all 16 seeds off of the tray and they've dispersed them in this spider web pattern um, where they took one seed, 
uh, put it on the leaf litter, put some leaf over it, came back, and then continued to disperse each of those 16 seeds individually. But caches can have multiple seeds in them. Like I said, hoarding, hoarding is a spectrum. And so in this center photo, you see a cache that has three acorns in it. But I found caches that were as large as 14 acorns, as well as all these other things that these um, small mammals were putting into their caches. So we're not really sure who is where on what spectrum, but that is exactly what we're looking for. So to give you an idea of what it looks like um, as you track this out in the field, Here's a video of me following this trail that is very, very well used. You can see a big band of fluorescent powder. Sometimes you only see specks of powder here and there, and it's very difficult to track. But this one's very clear. You can see a seed here, and then the trail continues to a hole here. And there's a seed right there at the entrance as well, but a lot of seeds were taken down into the burrow there. And so just from that clip, you can see that the two seeds at the top, that cache location is much more likely to germinate than the ones that were brought down to the burrow. So just within this one individual's decisions, they're making many different decisions that are impacting the regeneration probability of these seeds. So finally, to give you uh, the meat of the project here are these videos of individuals choosing seeds. And even though I'm not measuring personality here, it's already pretty clear, at least to me, um, how these in different individuals are choosing to interact with the seeds. You have some that seem to be more like window shoppers. So this is my window shopping mouse. He's just, he sniffs one seed. Two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Inspected it for a little and then decided to harvest the seed. So he kind of checked out his options a little bit before he decided what he wanted. Now in this next video is also a mouse. It's a different mouse and he is much more of a deliberator. And even though he spent all that time interacting with his seed and deciding whether he would take it, he still rejected it in the long run. So he ignored the seed. And even others are less picky and they just snatch up a seed right away. And sometimes the cameras aren't even fast enough to catch their selection events. And we just have to use the reads off of the RFID uh, reader board and antenna setup. So what's important here I wanna mention is that these seeds are very, some of these seeds, some of these acorns are very large, five or six grams. And so a small mammal that's 15 to 20 grams is going to be taking an acorn that is a third to a quarter of its weight. And to pick up something that's that heavy by your mouth means that you're going to be giving up the opportunity to be able to scan your environment properly and to be vigilant for any any predators along the way. So it is a risky behavior to take the acorn as well. Now this last video of seed selection is a northern short-tailed shrew. And if you remember earlier, they are insectivores. So what is he doing at my tray? I'm not really sure, um, but you can see that he is not well equipped to handle acorns. I just can't get it in his mouth. So of course, with wildlife research, you'll always come into contact with things that you don't expect. You'll have species, visit your trays that you don't expect, or the weather, or any number of things. But here are some examples of some cool, unexpected things So 
So this is a black bear. And I hope you can hear the munching of the acorns. He makes them sound very delicious. And black bears are acorn predators. They have been documented to pilfer the caches of squirrels. So it's not really that surprising that he came to eat them, but they do make a mess. And you can see those beautiful footprints that he made in the fluorescent powder. So I always know when a bear has come to my station before I even see the camera. And the next pesky visitor that I've had is a raccoon. Um, I actually started putting these cages out around my trays to protect my seeds around them. And you can see in this video that it was very effective at deterring them. So I've just finished scoring the thousands of videos that I've collected and I'm now in the process of analyzing the data to see what patterns we might see. So stay tuned if you're interested in seeing whether personalities really do differ in their personality or uh, in their dispersal of novel seeds. However, I can share some interesting results that we found in the last eight years of this study. Alison Brem was really pivotal in the beginnings of the Small Mammal Personality Project. She developed a lot of the protocols that we still use, and in particular, she helped develop that portable RFID reader board and antenna that's so important to our experiments. Without being able to identify who came to our seed tray, we wouldn't be able to look at personality at all. So this is just one of the many findings from her studies. Um, here on the graph, on the x-axis, you have a scale of anxiety where individuals on the left are highly anxious and individuals on the right are not as anxious. And on the y-axis is the dispersal distance, so how far these individuals are taking the seed. So is there a relationship with this personality variable and how far they're willing to take a seed? There is. We find a positive correlation where individuals that are less anxious are taking seeds farther. And so we see here, past all the theorizing and all the hypothesis, real evidence that personalities have true ecological consequences. And dispersal distance is one of the most important uh, measurements for the probability that a seed will germinate. Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but that movement away from the parent tree is really important because you're not competing against all of your brothers and sisters. You're moving away and using resource and not having to compete for those resources, that sunlight, that water. Um, and so it's important to move farther. And so personality is important here. Another study in our lab took each interaction a mouse had with a red oak seed and scored the overall interactions on a scale of antagonist to mutualist. And we found that not all individuals are equivalent. Some individuals are purely antagonists where every single interaction that they have with a red oak put together, they were fully antagonists and others were fully mutualists, where everything that they did, they cached the seed, they put it in an optimal uh, microhabitat for germination, they were mutualists. And then you have all of the individuals in between. So here we see that individuals exist on a spectrum, but we don't really see personality here. And so this next study or this next finding was looking at the probability that an individual would have a positive interaction with a red oak acorn based off of the personality trait of timidness. So we found that individuals that were less timid were more likely to interact positively with a seed and more timid individuals were more likely to interact negatively with a seed. So hopefully having gone over all the reasonings behind why we think personality is important to incorporate in ecological studies, and showing the results that support this hypothesis, you're also on Team Small Mammal Personality. Now, before I leave you with some take home messages, I wanted to share one last video where I set up a camera to watch what happened to a, uh, I believe this was a 12 acorn cache that this mouse made. 
So this is in November of 2021, and I, the video spans about over two weeks. So this is the original mouse that made the cache, and he's come back to check on it. The next day, he came back to check on it again, even in the pouring rain. He's putting leaves on it and covering it. And then on the 28th, he recovered some seeds. And then we have a pilferer. And then he comes back that evening to check on his seeds <clears throat> that are no longer there. So to wrap up, I'll leave you with these three big messages about small mammals. Small mammals play a vital role in the maintenance of forests. Personalities make different decisions at key stages of the seed dispersal process. And lastly, I hope I've convinced you that conservation should be more than just biological variation or genetic variation, but it should also include behavioral variation. I want to thank Alessio, of course, as the principal investigator and all the other students within the lab, Allison Brem, Gabriella Dree, Maisie Mers, and Bridget Humphreys, as well as the giant team of field technicians and volunteers that we use in order to do the work that we do. I also want to thank our funding, the Maine Agricultural and Forest Research Station, the National Science Foundation, and the University of Maine Graduate Student Government. So thank you guys so much. And thank you. I'll open the floor for any questions. Thank you, Ivy, incredibly. It was wonderful to go into the forest with you at night. It was incredible how you showed us an animals, the, the small mammals perspective. I mean, my heart broke when I saw the squirrel go back to the carefully tended seeds and then have them not there anymore. It was, it's just, you gave us a wonderful, wonderful view. And you brought up so many questions, my goodness. Oh, good. And I, I know you probably are still working on answers to yes. some of them, but, but let me start to ask some of them. Uh, have you found that any species tend to be more bold or more shy, or mm -hmm. is the behavior pretty well distributed? Yeah, so there, that is one of the big questions that we'll be looking at um, soon. Bridget Humphreys will actually be looking at this continuum, uh, like the behavioral composition of different species. So there isn't a formal analysis done, but anecdotally, they are very different. I did mention that there was a different mouse. There's the deer mouse and the white-footed mouse, um, which we don't get very often in our sites. But these two species in the emergence test, one will always emerge and the other one will never emerge. So right there already, you're seeing one personality trait that seems to be very conserved within a species. And I think, yeah, it has to do with, you know, what is important for that species um, in order to survive? What's like this big thing that everyone is I guess like faced with a big problem that they're all faced with. And so they all have to be that kind of way. Um, so yeah, they definitely. 
That's amazing. Uh, we have a question here from Glenn, who was the one who brought the New York Times article to my attention in oh. the first place and said, wouldn't this be an amazing person? And yes, Glenn, you were so right. Uh, so he says, do animals within the same species pilfer from one another? Ah, yes. So that is the big leading theory for why scatter hoarding evolved in the first place. Because individuals are stealing from each other and you have this very conspicuous one cache, in order to have this leg up over these pilfers, you need to be able to kind of trick them. And so that's why scatter hoarding is thought to have evolved because it's the cashers advantage over the pilfers, um, I guess, ability. So your question of whether different species or the same species, it happens both. They are all pilfering from each other all the time. I think the estimate right now is that within and in like all the caches of one individual, 2% of their caches are pilfered every day. And so if you are not con continuing to make caches or pilfering from other people, uh, other mice, I always call them people or other mice, <laughs> <laughs> or voles or whatever or other small mammals you won't it's not sustainable and so pilfering is yeah a very very important question that um yeah one of our graduate students just finished a study on and was looking at whether different personalities were more likely to pilfer from each other and they and she did find a, a positive correlation between in both mice and voles of personality having an influence on pilfering ability yeah, so I don't know, maybe there's individuals that are like, they're like the hardworking bee or the hardworking ants are like always foraging, always making new caches, and they're like very self-reliant. And then there's the other ones that are like, I don't know, the bane of society, and they're like stealing from everybody and working on what everybody else has already worked on. But I don't know. Amazing. Is there any sense of whether the survival rate is better for those who are shyer than for those who are bolder? Yeah, so one of the big hypotheses for why personalities exist is that um, they are, it's called the pace of life syndrome, where, and if, if you remember, I don't know if you remember R and K strategists, there are some animals like ants that are very, very small, and there's that trade-off between like reproduction now or maintenance of your body now. So like it's an ant versus an elephant. And the thought is that these different personality types are like K strategists and some are R strategists where one, some of them delay their reproduction. They try to kind of just thrive and maintain and live long enough to be able to reproduce and other ones that just like explode out of the womb and they're trying to have babies right away. That was the thought behind it. But lately, it's been shown that um, bold individuals in the wild, which is not what we would think, it's not what we would predict. We would expect that shy individuals were would be like the case strategists. They're living longer. They're trying to be very protective of themselves. They're going to push that reproduction later. We would expect them to live longer. But we're actually seeing the opposite. We're seeing that bold individuals in the wild are surviving longer. We don't know if it's because they have a higher competitive, like a competitive ability against individuals and maybe shy individuals have, and it's not like a pace of life syndrome thing. Maybe they have like um, some leg up when it's like a very high density of individuals is kind of is what we're thinking. But we don't know. It's very, very young field of research. We're still not really sure exactly why personalities exist and where they like the pros and cons of being one or the other but clearly they're important if they're all if they're still here interesting now you you were talking about how personalities tend to be consistent across a lifetime yes. um, you know whether you're shy or bold but but at least in humans right human teens are much more likely uh to take risks right yes. Yes. So is there an age difference too? Do there, is there some moderation as, as they get older? 
Yeah, I mean, I would expect that there would probably be a little bit, but the way that we look at personality is that it's more it's 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 your actions relative to the general population. So if you're a very shy teenager, you're probably going to be a shy adult, if that makes any sense. So it's like relative to the population. But like you as yourself, like maybe you are more bold as an adult than you were as a juvenile. Um, but yeah, we've run these tests in our mice and we haven't actually seen that kind of relationship where their um, personality, like personality scores change really drastically. Like we've tested um, differences in sex, differences in age, differences in reproductive status, all things that you think would be very, very important. But it seems that it's still very, very consistent within the individual. Wow. Amazing. That is neat. Uh, we have a question from Ronald who says that you indicate that tree species will evolve, particularly with climate change. Do you have indications of small animal species that likewise, likewise will move northward and may have different personality profiles that will challenge existing small animals? Hmm. Yeah, maybe I didn't explain it so well. I think in the lifetime that we're seeing now, we're not really going to see any evidence of evolution of a tree species. What it is, is that those ranges that a plant species is able to live in, so like those soil characteristics, the climate, the, pre the precipitation, those things, this window of where they're able to be is moving. Not okay. that they need to move, not that they need to change their own characteristics. It's that they need to move and track where they're able to survive. Um, but yeah, this evolving, I think the time frame that we're talking about is probably too small to be able to see evolution that quickly. But it's possible. I think some, if there's very, very strong selective pressures for say in acorn to now be like say the i don't know the species that they're typically um, dispersed by is not available at those northern ranges and they'll start to need to be able to entice other species then maybe i it's it's possible but i don't know this is like step like 0 0.001 <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> But maybe, what if we what if we use evolve in a in a more general sense, not not a scientific uh, sense? As the trees move, uh, tend to extend their range north. Yeah. Are some of these small mammals going to extend their ranges too? Oh, yes. And will their ranges go into the range that that other small mammals that's currently their sole territory at this point? Yes, it's possible. Um, so. The white-footed mouse is also coming up north. And one of the graduate students in our um, department is looking at the relationship between red oak acorns and white-footed mice. And it's thought, I might get this wrong, which is really embarrassing. Let me think for a second. One of them is like a acorn is more of an acorn specialist than the other. It's thought that like some of like the chemicals in their saliva are more able to break down like the chemical defenses within an acorn. And so <laughs> it's thought that they're moving north, not like and like part of the reason is because of their relationship with red oak acorns is because they're more able to to eat them and like use that energy than maybe deer mice are. I might be wrong, but yeah, that's a really interesting question because it's not just the plants that need to move. It is also the animals that need to move. Um, so yeah. It's I like co-evolve pollinators and plants, right? Yes. I mean, they that, that is really, I hadn't thought of that before. That's it's, really it's incredible. It's almost like a co-evolutionary arms race. That's like this yeah. weird like teeter-totter where you're like, 
I, the plant has an advantage, but then the animal evolves something to be able to take advantage of the plant. And then it just goes on and on and on until there's this like perfect balance where no one really has the advantage. Well, I guess it's just a moving, it's just a moving target at some point. Yeah. 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 It's cool. That is terrific. Uh, Ed says, seems like some dispersal destinations would be toward the nest and some away. Yes. Does that come into terms in terms of measurement of the dispersal? Maybe shy animals dispersed toward the nest? Yes, that is a beautiful question, which is one of the big grants that Alessio is actually writing right now. He's very interested in determining where individual, like where their home burrow is. And maybe one of the factors that is determining whether a small mammal will disperse, will not disperse, the distance, the direction, all that stuff is where that seed is relative to their burrow. Absolutely, 100%. I, I definitely think that is very possible. And I, and I couldn't tell you the specifics of this experiment because I don't remember it exactly. But I do believe that there was someone that looked at chipmunks and their distance from the burrow. And it may have been whether they decided to take it down the burrow or they decided to cache the seed on the surface based off of how far, far away they are from their burrow. That's a great question. I would love to be able to answer that question, but I don't know where my mice all live. Well, at least that I could know, but that wasn't part of our project. But this- Oh, we need to have a part two. That, yes. That's very, very clear. Very good. Uh, we have another question. Do the animals shift from hunting to seed protection based on a quota that they may have? Hmm. On a quota. You know, I, maybe a sense. Like, I need to have so like much enough. weight. I mean, I'm I'm making up what this question was, but no, no, no. I need to I need to have so much to survive to get mm -hmm. myself through. And then I can be smart and think about what's coming. So do I eat, you know, uh, uh, do I eat 50% for now? And then once I feel that I'm comfortable that my body weight's adequate for now, do I start eating only 20%? Yeah, well, do they ration? Yeah. I have no idea. That's where those tiny cameras need to hurry up and get get developed so we can put it on them and be able to count actually how many caches they have yeah one of the coolest ways that i love to think about how small mammals manage their caches they're like these like bankers where they have like they're constantly like investing their money and collecting money but they have them in all these tiny little accounts and they like squish them together to like invest or they'll use them here and it's like i don't know I, I would imagine that there is some very specific way that they do stuff. But then at the same time, these animals only live for one year. And so that overwinter survival probability is very important, but they don't live very long. So yeah, I don't know how much into the future they're trying to predict and, and, and um, I guess, like react to the one really cool study there, the red. So I think everyone knows what masting is, but maybe not. That was my next question. You oh, read okay. my mind and the I'll question is mine. Yeah. So masting is basically this large synchronous timing where all the species of one, all the plants of one species release all of their seeds at the same time. And so acorns do that where in one year, all of the seeds from every acorn from every oak tree is falling and you have like thousands hundreds of thousands of acorns on the ground but then the next year there'll be nothing and maybe the next year there'll be nothing but then maybe the next year there might be a small mast and um so where was i trying to go with this the fir the first thing was that red squirrels are have been shown to be able to predict when masting events happen. And the wow. year before, they'll actually get pregnant and have babies right before a masting event. Like they know it's coming and they know that they're gonna be able to provide for them. Wow. Yeah. Um, Even though they may not be around 
So it is really, it is looking into the future for, for uh, their genetic line to do yeah. that. But red squirrels live longer than mice. So maybe that's why they do it and the oh, mice okay. don't. Amazing. Sorry, did I answer your question about masting or was there some additional? Yes, no, that was exactly what the question was. Just to make sure that everyone knew what masting is. Uh, we have another question from Glenn. There was a 60 minute show about memories that squirrels have regarding cache location. If I recall, it was fairly high. Birds too. I've read it about birds. They some their memory. Oh no, I think, I don't know whose internet connection is not great. It's Do mice Beth. have good memories for that? Beth, we need you to repeat the question. Your screen froze and we didn't get oh, the Oh, I either. am so sorry. Uh, the, uh, that there was a 60 minutes program on squirrels and their memories for where they had cached things. And I also mentioned that I knew birds had really good memories. And sometimes I forget, at which species it is clears out their memory and starts it again the next year. Do well, these small mammals? <laughs> the what? Uh, they don't. Um, sorry, okay. I don't think they do, but that's because they don't live for very long. So I don't think they, they, yeah, I don't know how long a black capped chickadee lives, but I think it's more than a year. So okay. I don't think that they do, but. Yeah, that memory thing is something that um, another graduate student is looking into. They're looking at like, what are the cues that a small mammal uses in order to find where their cache is? A lot of the thoughts are is that they're actually using like these really big landscape variables in, in order to find where they are. Um, but yeah, how many think how many pieces of information they can put in their brain seems like a like a psychology like a neurology study. <laughs> and whether they forget them or not, we would have to we would have to find individuals that live for multiple years, and we we really just don't get that very often. I think every year um, at the start of the field season, I might be lucky to catch one or two from the previous year. Wow. Yeah, they their lives are just crazy. They're 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 Alessio calls them the meatballs of the forest. Like everything Aww. wants to eat them all the time. And they have like no defenses, like like very, very like maybe the northern um short tailed shrew does. <laughs> Mice really don't. And like even blurinas hunt them even like blurinas hunt them and they're the same size. So like, they're just like these things that are, they like live fast, die young. And they just like, that's how they go. They can't, oh. they can't plan too much or react <laughs> too much. But oh. whatever they do have seems to be working to some point. Oh, that is sad. Uh, so when, you, when you're looking at trees, and my guess is this is, would be a very hard one to answer. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at trees moving north, uh, or higher, what, however they're moving, and the the mice and other small mammals helping them. Do you have any sense of how much they can help a species move in a year? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, honestly, it just takes one seed, though, doesn't it? Yeah. It just yeah. takes one seed to grow into one tree, and then one seed to grow into another tree. So... Yeah, I don't have a sense of what the proportions are, like how much they would be helping. I mean, based off of that statistic that like for a preferred seed, there's a 95% harvest rate. If yeah. that seed that's trying to migrate is highly preferred, then they're going to be, they're going to have a really hard time moving up north. Um, so it's going to have to be, I think, I don't know, maybe the ones that are, I, I don't know. what What's cool about that question though is that this preference for a seed and the way that they interact with them changes all of the time. It changes with what else is available in the environment. Maybe this is a really highly preferred seed when there's nothing else available, but then say it's a masting event for something else. Then like, I don't know, like all of these questions, like to me, I like love asking these really to the point questions, but then in the end, the answer is always, there's so much to consider and it's so hard to be able to come up with like one like big answer to say 
how this is going to work, but everything, I don't know, everything's changing. It's hard to see. It's hard to, it's hard to predict. Well, it's so exciting and it's so neat that you've clearly got all our brains thinking about it. And, and <laughs> you guys are asking the we're questions going to that I'm need, asking. We're going to need more answers, Ivy, so you're going to have to come back and talk to us. And, and the final question I'm going to ask is, does the research project need volunteer tourists? Oh <laughs> That's our God. final question. From that would be great. Um, I was telling Beth and Barbara earlier that this is unfortunately the last year of our study. It was meant to be an eight-year study. It's an eight-year study. Um, but I don't know, maybe in the future there will be more things happening. But this year, I think there could be use of volunteer tourists if that is something that you're interested in. We're running, let's see, how many experiments this year? There are two experiments this year. Um, and one of them is an experiment to try to understand how different individuals are, like they're foraging efficiency. So oh. Daisy is putting out these seeds in an area and she's gonna set up cameras and she's gonna watch who are coming to forage the seeds and who are the ones that are foraging them the most efficiently or the fastest? Um, that's a question, like a very basic question that no one has really looked at before. We've looked at it, you know, not considering personality, but with personality, it's just so, it's been like so hard to understand personality because the technology is like just here, just now in order to be able to portably put something out there to say, this is this individual. It's, it's very new. So yes, I think she would actually really appreciate help, but she'll have to, she's still developing the project now to see how it's going to be. She's running into all kinds of issues. She was telling me just the other day that she's going to put out white, do you know how big white pine seeds are? They're, they're like, they're maybe like this small yep. and she's going to put them out just like on the forest floor. She's going to, and then have to be able to find them again. And oh. I was like, I, I really, I don't know how you're going to do that. <laughs> we're like, oh my goodness. We're always like sitting in the office being like, what if you did this? I'm like, no, but then it would, then it would affect, you know, the olfactory cues on the seed. And now you're, you know, you can find it, but now the mouse is going to react differently to it. So it's, it's like this giant headache. So maybe when she figures out what she's going to do, I'll let her know that there are possible volunteers from the Newton conservators. Okay, do that. And we will keep in touch. And tomorrow, as I usually do, I will send out a, a message to everyone who registered and with information and letting them know that uh, they can get in touch with you through me at webinars at newtonconservators.org. Oh, wait, let's hold on. We, we have a, a question that popped up that said, I know it's getting late. Uh, but so we'll do this one last question. And I have uh, one last question too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, whether an RFID detector net can track the mice in real time, like whales. So I guess you mean a network, like, you know, you, you space them. Oh, oh my God. I'm writing this down. I've never thought of this before. Hold on. That is interesting. So to try to understand how they're moving in the environment. What we what we have is, it's not the same. And that's a great idea that I'm going to be looking up right after this. Uh, we put our traps in a grid pattern so that when we catch an individual in a trap and then the next day we catch them in a nearby trap and then the next day we catch them in another nearby trap, we can estimate like their home ranges. Like where are the areas in our grid of traps that they're like spending the most time in? And that's how we've been able to kind of look at, you know, how different personalities are selecting for different microhabitat variables. Like what are the places in the site that they're, that they prefer and like to be in? So this wow. RFID network is interesting. And I'm wondering like what new details you could get from this. What is, yeah, the problem with traps is they enter in the trap and then they can't move. Like that's it. And also, why do they go in the trap? Is it because they feel safe? Is it because it's safer to their burrow? But that's, is that where they're foraging? Is that where they are? Like we, like probably not. So actually this network is a really interesting idea. Um, yeah, I think I said earlier, or maybe I didn't. Um, in my seed experiment videos, or in my seed experiment, 
like you put out nine stations in a 90 by 90 meter grid and you expect to get, you know, I don't know, three different individuals visiting your thing. I'm just put, pulling out a number there. But some nights there was one individual that visited all nine stations and cashed no. all 168 acorns in one night. Whoa. It's it's crazy. They're like we are like only beginning to understand like what their capacity is to be able to disperse seeds and like i just like 90 by 90 meters like and he was able to find all of them like i just it's crazy to me <laughs> that's amazing but yes that's yeah amazing. that would be great an rfid network thank you so much for the idea well i'm going to intervene with one last question you tantalized us with the idea that the personalities between two species were different the uh, white-footed mouse and the deer mouse. Which one is bold and which one is not? <laughs> I don't remember. Oh my oh, god! No. <laughs> we have so few white my white-footed mice that I don't remember. But hold on, I've also not been in the field for a while. I've been on like vacation mode for a second. If you give me ten seconds, I will be able to remember. Yep. Okay. White-footed mice did not exit the emergence trap but deer mice do deer mice then in that sense we would interpret as more bold than white-footed mice which is interesting because in the small pockets of the u.s where the two species do co-occur and we try to understand what is the relationship between these two individuals are they so similar that they're like full-on competitors or how are they kind of segregating their niches in the habitat in order for them to be able to coexist the thought is that deer mice are more dominant than white-footed mice. They're more competitive in environments where there's like um, a, a more, what's the word? A, a bigger winter. What's the word? Wow, this is terrible. A, a winter, a, a big winter. <laughs> wow. Because their overwinter survival ability is higher. I don't know why, and I don't know if that's related to boldness, but I don't know. The thought is that they are more dominant to white-footed mice uh, wow. in those kinds of habitats. Yeah, but white but white-footed mice do great in an urban environment. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, just well, not- you have given us a lot to think about. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you so much. That was just fascinating. And thank you, everyone. Good night.